Uh, good morning, everyone. So um, hopefully I'll pick up on a few of the things that Tom just uh, described. Um, in particular, getting to a sort of focus on people, human outcomes, rather than technology. It's something that I've been blogging about uh, recently and managed to start an argument with Adam Greenfield about just last week, so that will be interesting. Um, and I'm going to talk about open data kebabs and town planning, so let's see where that gets us. Um, I'm going to talk about Birmingham a lot as well. I didn't grow up in a city, I grew up on the edge of the New Forest. But I've been living in this city for more than a quarter of a century now. It's where I finished my education, started my family, built my career. Um, and it's a fabulous city, um, and I can talk to you for hours and hours about how fabulous it is. But like every city, it's got some problems. So um, this is Birmingham's life expectancy mapped across the, um, mapped across the local railway lines. And you can see, as the as the legend says there, within about eight stops you can shave nine years off the average life expectancy of a citizen. Um, actually in many cities that's, there's a much more marked difference. I was at a conference dinner a couple of weeks ago in London um, on uh, Chancery Lane and people were talking about technology enabling economic growth throughout the world and we didn't need to worry about inequality anymore and I pointed out, I won't get my directions right this time, but if you're born a mile that way from where I was in that restaurant um, on that evening. To, if you're born today a mile that way, you're likely to die 21 years younger than if you're born three miles that way. London's difference is about 21 years. Um, that's pretty common in um, cities across the country. Um, so let's have a look at Birmingham. Why might it be good or bad at creating life, creating value for, for people? So um, this montage of photographs shows some of Birmingham's creative centres um, split up by some of the features of the urban landscape that get in the way of people making, um, making a success for themselves by getting to those centres or getting between them. So um, in the middle you've got the Bullring Retail Centre, won't talk too much about that, it's just a shopping centre. Just above that you've got Cornwall Row where all of the finance and business expertise in the city is. Um, top left you have the Jewelry Quarter which is still a centre of advanced manufacturing, um, buzzing little um, urban area with some, some real urban grit in it but lots of creative activity as well. Um, to get from one to the other you have to pass the eight lanes of um, Great Charles Street Queensway um, put up there in Birmingham's infamous tunnels. Um, you also need to cross that to get over to the top right, which is Innovation Birmingham, the main technology incubator in the city, um, and to get from Innovation Birmingham down to Millennium Point and the Educational Quarter, you need to cross another dirty great road. Um, to get down to the Custard Factory, voted one of the best places in the UK by the Academy of Urbanism recently, you've got to get through Digbeth's um, ex-industrial um, manufacturing area. It's got some fabulous bits, but you don't always feel particularly safe walking around there, particularly not when it's not very light. I could go on and on and on. So these human aspects of place um, deeply affect how successful people are, are able to be. We talk an awful lot about bottom-up innovation in the smart cities world. That difference in life expectancy shows the difference in the opportunity to be successful bottom-up innovating to people in different areas of a city. So what can we try and do about this? Well, one sense in which I recently joined Amy um, to take this role as IT Director for Smart Data and Technology is I think we've got a business case for contributing to some of the infrastructure that might help that. So in Amy we employ about 22,000 people in this country who spend their time mending roads, cleaning parks, cleaning buildings, um, maintaining the infrastructure, building the infrastructure, operating the infrastructure that keeps cities running. We operate some light rail services, um, we run some uh, secure education facilities, so actually we run some services that touch really sensitive parts of very vulnerable lives. And one of the things we've got, because we're quite a large-scale commercial organisation, is a business case to invest in smart technology to operate those services more efficiently, more effectively, so both creating a financial incentive and, we hope, creating better outcomes. So you can see some screenshots here for how we're using technology platforms to sense our business, sense the environment around us, try and operate and plan our services more effectively. Um, also to then take that information and engage with it. So engage in a dialogue with communities um, about the services that affect them, about the environments that they live their lives, run their businesses in. Um, and because we don't necessarily assume that we always know how to do that in the best way, we're also engaging with business partners, social entrepreneurs, social enterprises. Um, you can see two SMEs that we're working with here, 
Vivo who um, work in the educational sector and Design for Social Change with whom we're hopefully starting a project soon supported by Innovate UK. Um, so people who know how to engage first and foremost with communities and about issues and then who are expert about using technology to do so when technology is the right vehicle. Um, so this is one of the ways that we're looking to use our critical mass, our responsibility as a service provider to local government and regulated industries um, to enable um, better engagement and different forms of engagement. Um, but we don't know everything about where um, we should try to address issues. Um, we're not experts in all the aspects of a city. So um, what about Birmingham's diet? It's a collection of my previously, I should stress, favourite kebab shops in Birmingham here. <laughs> if my wife's watching this, I haven't been to any of these for a long time. <laughs> Um, Birmingham has some, some real challenges with, with food. We're the diabetes capital of Europe, in part because we have a high proportion of Asian populations who are more susceptible to diabetes on average, um, in part because we don't, in general, have a particularly good diet. Um, now, I didn't start thinking about food in Birmingham. No one in Amy or in my former employer, IBM, started thinking about food in Birmingham. These people did at a hackathon about uh, three years ago now. Um, so. We've got a set of people here who came together for an activity that I'm sure all of you will be very familiar about. What can we do to use our skills and to use the data and technology available to us to make Birmingham a better place? Um, in the open conversation at the top, which, as every time I give this story, people point out, is mostly full of white men and is not very representative of Birmingham, so this is a challenge that we need to fix. Um, in that conversation, however, Uge Duty, who sat way at the back, you can't really see him very well in this picture, said, I went to this huge family wedding at the weekend. At the end of it, there was loads of food left over and it all got thrown away. It was all produced by professional catering services in certified environments. Surely we could have done something better with it. So over the course of a couple of days, a few people here, hacked together an app that connected information about professional catering services in Birmingham and soup kitchens and homeless shelters. So in principle it has the ability to connect people with spare food with people who need food to, to give away. It's a great little idea and one of the examples of the sort of ideas that come up when you get people together like this, giving their time freely in a place that they care about. One of the challenges, though, is how do you take that idea and do something more substantial with it? So it was a great idea and a great piece of code. It's there on GitHub for anyone who, who wants to use it. But it didn't result in people driving vans around Birmingham every evening redistributing food. Um, and that isn't a problem that I've found a way to solve yet. But it did start sparking the question, how could we go a bit further? How could we scale the idea? So. This is what we've been doing for the past two, two and a half years now. Um, about 20 institutions in Birmingham coming together in a completely non-commercial collaboration just to listen to good ideas from around the city. So you've got the usual suspects in there in the sense that you've got the council, you've got IBM, you've got SCC who are one of Birmingham's largest privately held companies. They're also the largest privately owned technology company in Europe. Um, they operate cloud data centres in Birmingham and all sorts of things. Um, we've got the Heart of England NHS Foundation Trust, we've got the LEP. We've also got some, some less obvious suspects. So Millennium Point, which is a, a large um, institution that supports education and entertainment and culture. Um, we've got OpenStreetMap, um, who are a non-commercial um, organisation. We've got Droplet, a local startup, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the idea of this was to bring together some of the people in Birmingham with the willingness to listen to good ideas, no matter where they came from, and the resources to potentially support them, and the networks to potentially support them. So some interesting things have happened as a result of this. So um, Centro's um, Birmingham's public transport executive. Um, you know, like any public sector organisation, they don't have a lot of spare cash. Um, what they've recognised is they also don't have all the ideas about how to make public transport better in Birmingham. So they've been open, running sponsored hackathons, and what the Smart City Alliance did was help them to engage with the city's community of entrepreneurs. Um, they've had a whole set of good, potentially viable business service ideas in transport emerge from that activity and because these days if you've got a good idea for how to improve a transport service chances are it's going to reduce the carbon of tra transport if it's successful they're then able through Innovation Birmingham to get funding grants from the Climate Kick which supports low carbon initiatives so without any central funding simply by connecting a network in a way that wasn't connected any, anymore we've connected challenges with innovative capacity with funding streams and things are starting to happen there'll be a, a new um, a new 
personal transport information service piloting in Birmingham soon called My Journey as a result of this. We also helped something happen in the Longbridge redevelopment. So you'll all be familiar with the demise of, of MG Rover a um, decade or so ago, been going on a long time. It is and remains a sad loss for the UK and the region's manufacturing capability. Um, car manufacturing is starting to do really well again in the West Midlands, thanks to, to Jaguar Land Rover. But in the meantime, you've got this enormous great site where this huge mile-long factory used to be. Um, actually, this site was one of the biggest petrol exporters in the country for a little while because they, when they went to start redeveloping it, they realised it was basically a lake of spilled petrol <laughs> sat underground. Um, but now they're starting to build a new town there. What was one of the challenges with this town? Well, it's the HGVs following sat-nav directions to postcodes that didn't exist when they were building it. They started turning up in the village of Northfield down the road, which wasn't very helpful. There's a whole set of people in Birmingham who've been wanting to fix this for a long time but hadn't been able to get access to the Longbridge site, and that's open street maps. So one of the connections that the Alliance made was between those organisations. So Birmingham the West Midlands has one of the best mapped um, set of roads and buildings in the country for open street maps, now including the Longbridge redevelopment, helping the lorries get to the new, new destinations they need to get to. And we did something about food too. Um, through convening a set of what we thought about as unusual suspects from our, our networks to try to follow on from that, that food hackathon. And we brought some technology entrepreneurs from Birmingham and London in, we brought a nutritionist, we brought the council, we brought the NHS, and we talked about what we might, what we might do. Because the bottom up world of innovation doesn't work very top down, what happened next wasn't what anyone walked out of the room thinking it would be. What happened was that Shalene Milu, the lady on the right who was the nutritionist, got inspired to start a new business, got connected to a property developer who had the old school building here on Harborn High Street and had promised to the council to, to operate a responsible and venture into it. And about two years later, the Harborn Food School was opened by Hugh Fernley Whittingstall there in March. Um, it's an interesting business model. It's a community interest company and it's in Harborn, which is a relatively expensive part of Birmingham. So it's offering food te teaching courses taught by not quite as famous chefs as you there, but by local and regional chefs um, from various different backgrounds, various food cultures. What that business model enables them then to support are community initiatives, healthy eating initiatives. They ran an event recently in partnership with the NHS around um, lifestyles and diets for, to support diabetes. So starting to look at the food culture to tackle one of the, the city's business biggest challenges. So wh when I try and think about this, this long rambly story I've taken you on through some things that happened in Birmingham, um, some things that, that Amy have been involved in, but not wholly things that, that I do in my working life. It's a little bit of a mixture. Um, the, the biggest inspiration to me in this has been Kelvin Campbell's work. Now, I can talk to you for hours and hours about the long and deep connections between town planning and technology <laughs> around the thing called the design pattern. Um, but I won't do that today. I'll talk a little bit about smart urbanism. Um, Kelvin asks the question, what are the characteristics of urban policies and environments that give rise to massive amounts of small-scale innovation? That sounds like scaling smart cities to me. Um, he comes from a town planning background, so you can see here some of the work that's emerged in looking at how, um, how, how to avoid slums developing as cities rapidly urbanise in the developing world. So it's about putting basic grid infrastructures in place, not full infrastructure because no one can afford it, not housing because no one can afford it, but basic infrastructure and patterns so that when people self-build with the resources available to them, a better quality of infrastructure emerges than would have happened starting from a blank canvas. Uh, so when I think about that in terms of smart digital urbanism, these are then some of the things that I think about. So any infrastructure in cities, technology or otherwise, needs to be accessible and adaptable. So in technology terms, back to many of the things that Tom talked about, open data, open APIs, open standards, open architectures as well, because it's only for open architecture we understand the purpose of a system and where to engage with it. Um, we need to be engaging, so again in technology terms that might be about offering open data, having a conversation about it, so a brilliant presentation from ODI Leeds just last week about some of the work they've done using open data um, to tackle the issue of, of empty housing in the city, uh, and social media is a form of dialogue as well. Um, engagement isn't all about technology, I fully appreciate that, I'm just talking from a technologist perspective, how can we support it? It's about top-down and bottom-up. So what are the top-down things we can do to support bottom-up innovation? Well, in planning frameworks, we should be mandating these things. When people develop property, 
taking huge investments from pension funds often to develop physical infrastructure that will then generate commercial returns, as well as demanding public space in those developments, we should demand public technology, public data. That doesn't require investment, it just requires policy. Um, we also need the soft infrastructures. I've talked to you about just one of those in Birmingham. This is another form of soft infrastructure. Uh, there are many around the country. Um, and finally, and I thought a little bit about this phrase, I think we need to be entrepreneurial and enterprising. What, what I've observed in the Smart City Alliance through chairing it for the past two and a half years is that if we try to run initiatives, we fail because we're already people with busy jobs, often people um, running companies with low margins or running public sector institutions with falling profits. Um, that doesn't work. If we create an environment and offer support and connections that allow people to exceed, and if we invite interesting people to come talk to us, then their entrepreneurial and enterprising nature leads them to do things, and with just a little bit of help, we can help them be an awful lot more, more successful. And I think there's a, a hugely important um, aspect of scaling smart cities in all of us recognising that. I hope that's been interesting. I hope I'm just about on time. Thank you very much.